Hello everybody and welcome to the Listen to Keith Hargan podcast, episode number four. Today on the show is the one and only Ashley Campbell, an amazing banjo player, an amazing singer-songwriter, an amazing cook, uh, and I thought she'd be an absolute fantastic fit to have here on the podcast for you guys to listen to. Ashley's been on the scene for a very long time, she's been engrossed in music, her dad was the one and only Glenn Campbell, um, and she's got so many interesting things to say. Enjoy the podcast and I'll see you soon. Okay. Well, Ash Campbell, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Keith. So, tell me what's happening. What's happening down with the the lockdown loners and the, and the quarantine queens these days? <laughs> um, we're all just kind of staying in our homes in Nashville. It's very strange because I'm I'm you know I'm at my house and my mom and my brother live across town and it's just weird having to call them and be like, I miss you, even though they live like 13 minutes away. (laughs) It it really is. I mean, my mom and dad, where we live here on Inch Island um, in Donegal, my mom and dad literally live like a mile away as well. And there's a beach beside their house that we walk and we're just like walking past the field, uh, the the hedge at the bottom of their, their garden by the beach and like waving at the window. It's, it's, it's a real strange, surreal, like none of it really it's, and the longer it goes on, it seems to get stranger. (laughs) <laughs> yep, it's getting stranger and like nothing would surprise me now. Like if zombies started coming out and biting people, I would <laughs> just be like, "All right, this is happening. Let's do this." Busting out my shotgun. Here we go. <laughs> have you seen that have you seen that movie that just got released on Netflix? Um the one with Matt Damon about oh. basically exactly this. It was a coronavirus about a pig and a bat. No. It's like it was made in 2012, and it's so funny how it just appeared on Netflix in the last week or two. There was it's definitely one worth. Called, was it Contagion or something? Contagion. Uh, that's it. Yeah. I haven't watched it, but I have been kind of digging into some zombie, <laughs> zombie TV shows and books. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of my cousins actually texted me last week. He was like, "Bro, do you know where I can where I can buy a, a crossbow?" Here in Ireland, and I'm like, I'm like, Dude, you need to chill out. Well, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is. It's it's a strange time. I mean, I don't know about you. Did you have any shows cancelled? I had it cancelled basically this whole year by the looks of it. Yeah, I had a bunch of stuff um, from March and April and May that got. Luckily, it didn't get cancelled. It got postponed uh, until fall. So I'm 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 really lucky in that respect um, that it wasn't cancelled, but. It, it still it it makes you think like wow if if I couldn't perform live what would I do to make money and and luckily these um it's been really cool to be able to do some live stream shows and have people be able to tip or like a ticketed live stream show like on stage at where you can still connect with fans but um, also kind of pay your bills you know by still doing music. Yeah, it's funny. I, I th- it's. I think years ago, you know, when musicians used to tour, you know, musicians used to make a lot of money back in the day, whereas touring musicians now, it's just a job. I, I, people must be sick of me saying this, but it is just a job like anything else. You know, you go out, you aren't coming home and buying Ferraris. You know, you're going out to tour to pay your rent for the year. And, mm-hmm. and when you're a touring musician, you only get paid like when you go on tour. So if you only do like two, three tours a year, that's your chunk for the entire year and you have to make it sort of last you have to spread that butter evenly or it's not going or it's not going to last you know exactly yeah and this <laughs> the whole virus thing has got me really <laughs> rethinking the way i save what i make you know because when stuff like this happens which hopefully never happens again but um you know it'd be nice to have something in savings <laughs> yeah so i don't know how to pause the the sounds of notifications coming into my computer me neither. It's the most annoying thing in the world. I actually try to stop that on my laptop as well. Because if I mute it, I wonder if I can turn it on Do Not Disturb or something, like the, like on your phone. Don't worry okay. about it. It's only a beep. I wouldn't even sweat it. Okay. Um, so, Ash, what music have you been working on? Have you any albums coming out? Um, what, yeah. What are you doing? So, um, I have recorded a brand new album. It's album number two. I recorded it actually in December of 2018, but you know, I don't have a label and we just, I went through a change in management. So I've just been kind of sitting back on it. And now we're finally getting the ducks in a row and I've released two singles from it. And, um, we are, we are planning to release the album this summer, probably July at the latest August. And I'm really excited about it. Cause it's, um, I feel like it's a truer representation of who I am as an artist. Like I love my first album, but 
just sound wise and style wise, I feel like um, I just get closer with each album to to exactly expressing who I am as far as a musical being, you know? Your first record, did someone else produce it or did you do it yourself? Or Sorry, I should have looked that up, but I don't know. Did, did okay. someone else produce it? or? Um, I co-produced the first record with my brother, Cal, and um, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, gosh, I can't believe it's been, goodness gracious, we recorded that one in at the end of 2016. That's so crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it is crazy where time goes. I, I just was looking at my first record that I recorded in uh, in Los Angeles with David Foster and Joachim Van. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year, that'll be the 10th year anniversary of that. Oh. I'm just like, Jesus, what? That's like, I can, like, and there's like five tracks that were never released. And we recorded that album was recorded in L.A. And then we recorded the strings in Abbey Road and Angel Studios. Like it was a big record. Um, and there's like five tracks just lying there. So I'm thinking that I'm going to try and maybe hit up Verve Universal. I can't even remember who owns it now and see if they want to do like a re-release or something. Oh, but the same thing. It's, it's funny. It's funny when you look at your first record. My first record's the same. It's this hugely, I mean, it was different for me. I had, you know, big name producers who really want to put their stamp on things. But, and I love that record. I have nothing against it. But it's funny now where my music is compared to my first record. As well, I mean, I'm working on my sixth or seventh album right at the minute, um, and it's it's bonkers how different it is right now. But it's yeah. funny, I feel like where I feel like where I am now is where I've always kind of was aiming to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's same way. A long time. I record every time I record a record, which has been twice. Like almost immediately after we're done recording, I already am thinking, oh, I would have done this differently, and I would have, I wish I could have done this, and oh, wouldn't it be great? You know, I feel like that's just inevitably being human and being a musician, though. So at some point, you just have to go like, this is what we came up with, and this is what we created at that moment, and we loved it, and we still do, you know? And then yeah. and you learn so much for the next one, so that's why your records are constantly evolving, which is kind of cool, you know? It's like people can see the growth within your music of, of your musicality and your tastes and, and who you are. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same, too. It's funny, like... When you first do, you know, I was I was young too though when I did my first record. I was like 23 or 24, my first solo record. But I mean, like, you do get used to just letting things go. I mean, I remember my first few records too. My second record that I recorded, I ended up actually I recorded a record way before even my first record, and I done what you were saying, where I sat on it and sat on it and sat on it, and I just released it last year, and I called the album 10 years later. It was a fully <laughs> finished record that I loved and my band here played in Ireland and we recorded it with uh, Van Morrison's engineer and sound guy and the Walsh in Amberville Studios. And I sat on it for 10 years. It was just like my thing. And it was an awesome killer, like country rock and roll album. And uh, yeah, it's weird how in your mind you're like, ah, oh, I would change that. And the more you listen to it, the more it eats at you and you keep thinking. But then the more records I don't after that, then I was just like, ah, you just have to let shit go. You just have to let it go into the world and you know, Nothing's perfect. You're going to find you're going to find blemishes even on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe you won't. I don't know. Sure. Um, your so your brother your brother Cal plays with you in your band, does he or not? Or? Um, no, Cal's actually playing. Uh, he's been playing in Beck's band. Oh, I think actually my old a friend of mine, uh, Jack Tempshin, the singer songwriter, Jack Tempshin, Eagles songwriter, his old manager. I think he had something to do with like um finding back or something like that or signing back to his first record mm -hmm. or something like that um and i think actually he posted a photograph somewhere on instagram of your brother playing with beck does yeah. your brother play percussion or drums or something or he he is a, a, fab, a fabulous drummer um but beck already has a drummer so cal is um mainly doing auxiliary percussion and he does triggering samples and he plays some acoustic guitar and does a lot of background vocals yeah, I think that's what I've seen him doing. Uh, shout out to uh, Bradshaw, if you're listening to Bradshaw. What's happening, buddy? I actually have Jack Tempson on the podcast on Wednesday night. He's going to be a character. Have you, ever, have you ever met Jack? Jack wrote Peace, Sleazy Feeling for the Eagles, and he wrote Already Gone for the Eagles. And No, I haven't met him. Slow Dancing for Johnny Rivers, and he wrote, like, him and Glenn Fry were best buddies. They basically wrote all, all of Glenn Fry's hits together. He wrote the theme tune to Miami Vice, and it wrote, like, Loads of really cool, interesting songs. I mean, he's, he's a good dude. 
Jack, Jack and I went on tour um, up the west coast of America about a year ago, and it was so funny because Jack, like, he's no spring chicken, and he was just like, and he was so up for everything we'd done, no matter what. He was like sleeping in the dirtiest hotels. He was like, love it, love it. Rental cars everywhere we went. He was just in good mood the whole time. Um, so now that you're, I, I, I follow you a lot on Instagram, Ashley, and you love cooking. I love cooking too. Yes. <laughs> um, like you cook, you cook probably more than me and I like to cook but you like you go for it you cook like a Christmas dinner every day by the uh, looks of it you gotta eat well you know some people I I, I don't know I uh, I live to eat <laughs> I don't eat to live <laughs> um but yeah I actually right before I jumped on on this Skype call I I was throwing some chicken wings in the fridge to marinate I'm making a uh, Thai fish sauce wings tonight <laughs> Nice. I have. I've only started eating bits and pieces of meat again. I, I'm like the worst vegetarian in the world. I've been vegetarian for four years, but I was brought up. My dad and all his uncles were butchers, and I was brought up like on meat hunting, fishing, mm-hmm. and then just with touring so much, I just stopped eating it. There was only so much Subway ham and McDonald's burgers you could eat when you're on the road all the time. And then yeah. the last year now, I've started eating like like I had a piece of venison yesterday, wild caught venison, which was mm-hmm. off the charts. Um. And the meat here in Ireland, like we moved back to Ireland this year to get, we've, we're starting a few businesses. And the meat here, I mean, we are spoiled, rotten. I don't think people here understand how good the meat is. Like everything here is just standard grass fed and pasture raised. And, you know, when you're in America, that's when you go to Whole Foods and it's like $40 a pound yeah. for a pasture grass fed piece of steak. You know? Yeah. There's a great butcher shop um, close to my house. I live in East Nashville and I've been going there and the quality really does matter like the difference between getting that fresh ground meat from the butcher like if i made some chili the other day and i got fresh ground beef like they they ground it up while i wait um yeah and it was just so tender and perfect and you know but when i buy from the grocery store in the like little prepackaged thing it's like every other bite you're like biting down on some kind of hard whatever you know mystery meat <laughs> Yeah, a butcher, a butcher's isn't really something you see all that often in that, in America. It's like here, it's it's common. Like every sort of every sort of corner store, there's probably a butcher sitting beside. Like it's just no one really goes to a supermarket here to buy their meat. It's all yeah local butchers and you know yeah, and it's you know the butcher that I go to, they're they're very um, on top of the quality of their their meat and where they get it from. You know, they get it all locally in Tennessee. Or at least, you know, maybe some of the surrounding states. But you just can guarantee that anything you buy there is going to be top quality, no hormones, you know, no antibiotics, just great, great quality meat. <laughs> yeah, they actually they actually do a thing here in Ireland where it's by law now if you buy a packet of meat out of any store, if it's not a butcher's, the butcher's can tell you where it comes from. But on the packets, it got like this barcode that you scan into your phone or whatever you've got. And it tells you the exact field where the, the meat has come from in Ireland. And in Ireland, they only sell Irish meat. They don't allow imports from any other countries or anything like that. We export a lot of meat. Mm-hmm. But it's it's like, you know, Kerrygold right now is like one of Ireland's biggest exports. Kerrygold butter it seems to be like everywhere I go in America, everybody's eating it. That's the only butter that I buy, actually. <laughs> it's the best. I have like, like here you just get Kerrygold at a gas station. I um Austin Jenkins... Uh, Austin, if you're listening, shout it. Austin's a producer, and do you know Austin Jenkins? Producer, um, um, no, I don't. Played so. White Denim, the band. He produced Leon Bridges, um, and all those. He got a Grammy anyway. But Austin came here to they produced my record with me last year, and he uh, every time I went to a gas station, he was just buying a full block of cheddar cheese and just eating it like it was a like a cracker. And every time I looked at him, he would have like a full block and just like eating the block. He's like, man, this is so good. <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not good for you, man. Um, <laughs> hey, so is it a birdie told me that you um, you dappled with comedy, or you still do comedy, or what's what's the drill? Tell me. Yeah. Um, so I moved to LA from Phoenix when I was 18, and I went to Pepperdine University, and I was a theater major. Like I didn't even intend on doing music as a as a career. I always played music and did musical theater, but. I just did not plan on becoming like an actual musician and artist. Um, but you asked about comedy. So I went to Pepperdine and I tried out for the improv team at Pepperdine my freshman year and I didn't make it, but I had so much fun in the audition. I said, I want to do this all the time. 
So I looked up improv schools in Hollywood and I found this one that was supposed to be the best. It's called the Groundlings. And so I enrolled in a class there. And so basically like, you know, twice a week um, for my entire four years at college, I was out in Hollywood doing improv classes because I just loved it so much. And then the next year I did make the, the improv team and I was on that for three years. And I just loved doing comedy. I, I, I had a goal. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. Um, but I just mainly just had fun doing it, you know, and I started doing sketch comedy, writing sketches, and that actually turned out helping me a lot with my songwriting, you know, just writing short five minute yeah, sketches, you know, cause that's basically what a song is. It's a, it's a short sketch. It's a picture of an emotion. And so I feel like just all that experience helped me, you know, in the music parts of my life as well. Did you do any stand up? Did you go to did you do much stand up nights or go to open mic nights or things like that or I wasn't so much into stand up comedy. I tried it once and I'm glad I did because <laughs> it's terrifying. Like if you can go and do a stand up, just try and do like a five minute set at an open mic, you'll be able to get through anything else as far as public speaking because that is the most terrifying thing and you're bombing and you're not doing well. But you may if you live through that, then nothing else is as scary as that, you know? <laughs> Did you did you ever go to O'Brien's Bar in Santa Monica? Do you remember the old dive bar, Irish bar in Santa Monica, on the main street between Venice and Santa Monica? They had a venue at the back, and they had comedy on like a Monday and Tuesday, and then they had like it was a rock. The toilets were like out beside the stage. It's clo it closed down about two years ago. You would know it. It's right on the main street there, between Santa um, Monica and Venice. I think I know what you're talking about, but I never went to that one. I was I was more of a I've been to Molly Malone's and. Um, there's another one that's on Wilshire or Santa Monica. I can't remember. That, ah, I don't know. <laughs> Molly Malone's was my first ever solo show in ah. America. I think. Good bar. That's a great yeah. pub. We played there when that's I was um, I was in a band with my brother Cal, and uh, it was kind of like an indie rock band, and we played a show there. And I remember my dad came to see it, and he was wearing a bright blue onesie. <laughs> did not give uh i don't know if i can curse on here he was he like he, he did not give a fuck he was just like <laughs> he was just how old how old was your dad then oh gosh he was um uh, late 70s <laughs> yeah so what what was it was that just his was that just his attire at the time he just didn't care that was just like he just, he just wanted to be comfortable and it was his favorite color blue <laughs> You know, and he was like in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. So it was kind of just like, all right, wear whatever you want to wear. That's fine. As long as you're comfortable and happy. Who cares? I mean, that should be Alzheimer's, a lesson. Alzheimer's or not, he's, he's 100% right, really, isn't it? No one should really care. Really. It should be a lesson to all of us. Absolutely. I mean, your dad, for those of you who don't know, your dad was Glenn Campbell, one of the greatest guitar players, slingers, singers, and entertainers the planet's ever seen. Um, and he was an absolute, I mean, I grew up listening to Glenn Campbell. I don't know, I, don't, you, I mean, sure, you know, like in Ireland, Glenn Campbell was huge in Ireland. I mean, he was huge everywhere. Oh, yeah. It, but he, he really was, like, he was off the charts. Your dad really was something else, like, you know? Yeah. Good he, for him. He was incredible. Blue, Monty, yeah. And, 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 uh, and Molly Malone's. That was, that's a picture they should have on the wall right there. I have, a, I have a picture. I'll send it to you if I can find it. I think, I think I've got it saved in a little file. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sadly, we're going through the same sort of thing right now with my grandmother, who um, my grandmother was basically like, like I would call her mom. You know, I'm, I'm pretty close to her. I was basically brought up with her. If I wasn't staying in my house, I was crashing in her house at the, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And she wouldn't tell my parents if I snuck out at nighttime and went for beers with my friends way before the age of the should have. And she used to tell my mom that she that I was, oh, he's a good boy. He's staying at home, Siobhan. Don't you worry about him. But um, <laughs> yeah, my grandmother right now, hey, she, we had to put her in a home um just before christmas um and it's it's a, it's an absolute nightmare i mean you know all about it yeah. you tell them, but it's an absolute nightmare and right now because of the coronavirus we can't we haven't seen i haven't seen her now since before i left for tour in march so my mom no one can even we aren't even allowed to go near the place we can't wave through a window she's on an, her room faces into a courtyard so we can't even get like up to her window and wave into her and yeah it's a nightmare I can't imagine not being able to visit my dad right now if he were still here, you know, if he were still in the memory care facility. Like, oh, I would just, uh, I don't know what I would do. Yeah. 
You know? I, I wonder too. I keep thinking to myself too, what effect it's going to have on them. You know, is it going to make it worse to an extent of like the memory loss of us or I don't know, is it going to make it better because they've got more time on their own? I, I mean, time will tell. I mean, it's never time. Time isn't a good thing for that. That's all they have is against them is time. Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah, we're going through that right now too. You know all about it. I mean, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, yeah, that documentary, sure. our mutual friend, that J- Jane, uh, Jane's going to be on the podcast in the next few days. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I've been trying to get her on. We were all set to do it the other day, and then something happened. But um, Jane done the documentary. Uh, I'll be me. Um, with your family and your dad, and I'm sure lots of people have seen that on Netflix. How long was that? A long process? Was that shot over? It must have been because t- it was a right a lot of tours, right? Yeah, it was shot over the course of about two years, I think, because um, they they were with us for that whole tour. Um, so they they filmed so many shows, you know, they just have so many hours of footage, countless hours. And, you know, obviously most of it's not even on the film. So, like, they could probably make a whole other f- movie <laughs> out of what they have. But it, they did such a good job. They, they you know, the filmmakers and, and everyone became family. And that's how we met Jane and mm-hmm. and um, her ex-husband, James, like, and Trevor Albert. They all became, like, family to us. So that was a another blessing that came out of that documentary, you know, is just getting close to those people and... Having their it must have been it must have been amazing for you too though. I mean, like uh, a friend of mine, Glenn um, Stearns, was on the podcast a few few days ago, and we were talking about whenever I first moved to LA, I always had this idea of, um, you know, remember it could be your last. It was a long story short, but we always said, you know, if you knew it was the last time you were going to walk on stage, um, you would make sure it's one of the best gigs you ever played in your life. If you knew it was the last time you had a sip of wine, you're going to savor that drink more than anything else on the planet. But for you, you kind of got to go on tour with your dad, knowing that it was probably going to be his last tour. And like that, that's something that you can really hold on to forever. I mean, that's an amazing thing to have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, every night I kind of like there was this built in moment where he would just do a song. He did a song called Moon's a Harsh Mistress, which is by Jimmy Webb. And he would just do it um, by himself, solo with just piano accompaniment. And it was such a cool moment in every show. And that was kind of when the band got to go off stage and maybe use the restroom or whatever if we had to, and or have a glass of wine or bourbon or <laughs> whatever. Um, but I always loved. I tried as much as I could if I, you know, didn't have something I needed to do off stage. I would sit kind of on the drum stand and watch from behind, and with the lighting coming in from the audience. And there's this one shot in the in the film that's kind of a slow motion of him kind of lit by the front so it's just his back to the camera and you know how when the lights are on and the you can see the dust particles flying in the air like I had that yeah. every night I would sit on the drums and watch him sing this beautiful song just flawless vocals every time and that was my like moment of little like always remember this always remember this moment of watching dad sing this song and and getting you know having the privilege of being on stage with him and so I just uh-huh you know, kind of had a nice moment of reflection in every show, which was really nice. Ah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, you, I mean, sad, but also very, very, very warming, the fact you got to do that with him. I mean, I'm sure any of my dad's a musician too. He never really toured. He, he grew up in a different era here. Um, But, you know, if you knew that was the last time you got to go out and play music with your dad for a while, you would you would make sure you would make it count. You know, when you have all... Man, you should, get, you should re- release like a live... Is there, there must be so much footage of all the shows alone, never mind all the backstage stuff. I think it would be cool um, to release a DVD or not. Who watches DVDs now? I don't know. Um, Blu-ray. A Netflix special or something of um, of the Ryman concert, you know, because there were two. So they could splice them together and, and you know, if because, you know, he had Alzheimer's and he made mistakes. Or it could be cool. I don't know. It, we, they have so much footage. We could definitely do a full concert version. You know, I think that would be really neat for people to see. I think they should 100 million percent do that, especially. I mean, ever who wouldn't? Everybody would love that. That would be an absolute hit. Get, I'll yeah. get on the phone right away with my people and ask them to do that. Yeah. Make it, make it happen, Keith. <laughs> I'll make it happen. Hey, and they just opened up a museum. Were you obviously you were there for the opening of the museum in Nashville? And yeah, unfortunately, very bad timing right now. <laughs> you know. I know. 
because they they opened and then coronavirus hit so they you know they had to close and they're still you know selling merchandise online it's a beautiful museum you know so i i hope people go when it opens back up because it's it's really beautiful they did a great job and it has a little stage in there so we're planning i'm i'm gonna help them plan and curate concerts to to happen in there and it's going to be kind of a neat, intimate music venue on Broadway, which is, you know, nice because it's, it's, it's all on Broadway. It's on Broadway. Yeah, it's second in Broadway. It's um right above Rock Bottom, although unfortunately, I think Rock Bottom just filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> hit um, Rock Bottom? <laughs> it hit Rock Bottom. Yeah, that's ironic. Um, But yeah, because of the coronavirus, it's like, what a horrible thing. But yeah, hopefully the museum can hold on because it's beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. And the people who have come through have really enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, well, this, oh man, every time I think, I've basically in my mind wiped out 2019. I'm supposed to be going, on, so my tour in March, I only got on the road. I, I was three shows in, they like a 23 show tour. Mm -hmm. So my tour was a wash. So we ended up moving all those dates to October. Yeah. And then um, I was supposed to be hitting the road at the start of June for five weeks. And that was just, I just I didn't even try and remove those. We just can't, I just cancelled that tour. Oh wow! And now I I I hate to say it, but I have a bad. I don't think my tour. So the March dates are moved to October. I can't see that happening. I really can't yeah. see it happening. Wow! I can't. I mean, cause, cause think about it. I don't know about your shows, but my shows. You know, when you're when you're selling your music through Instagram and Facebook and social media, you it takes like three or four months for those tickets to sell for a tour. So you can't sell them if, if if they say, all right, the doors are opened at the start of October and you're supposed to be going on tour two weeks later. You can't make it. I can't make it happen. So like for me, I would have to, everything would have to be back to normal for me for like July. And if it was any later than that, I I don't know. I just can't see it. I want to go, but I can't see it happen. Uh, I know. I'm, I'm holding on hope. I'm, I actually have a ticket to fly out to France <laughs> on June at the beginning of June, and I'm just like, uh, I don't know. And not to tour, but just to visit with some close friends of mine. Um, I don't know. I'm holding on to it, but I'm definitely emotionally prepared for it not to happen. But yeah, I, I mean, the flight, and it's still a full flight, so no one's canceled their June tickets yet. I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm not going to cancel it until I absolutely know for sure that it's not possible. I don't know. France right now is, they're like, they're like, worse than Spain right now, aren't they? They're like one of the top three they're, or four in Europe. They're on lockdown. I have uh, my friends that live there, you know, you have to get written permission to go on a walk outside the premises of your house. Like that's how serious it is. And where about some France are they? They're in the south of France. So at least that's nice. It's not crowded or anything. Like I can't imagine being somewhere like Paris or New York, you know, yeah, I mean, the south of France is beautiful. We were actually, Kelsey and I went there for our honeymoon. Um, we stayed on my buddy's yacht for like two weeks in Saint-Tropez, and we went around all those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was amazing. John Elway was there on the boat with us. He was partying with us for like two weeks. Um, and then Kelsey and I hired, we, we were going to like drive a car. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were going to drive a car all through south of France and down into Italy. And then when we were there, I mean, I love cars and motorbikes and anything with an engine. So we were thinking about it. I was like, what if we could rent like a vintage car? And we Googled it and we rented like this vintage Porsche 911 Targa, uh, 1976. And it really wasn't that expensive. It was like, I think it was like 16 or $1,700 for like 10 days. And that was the insurance and everything included. Um, convertible, beautiful, powder blue, like insane. The guy pulled us into this big lot full of, as all his own collection. And he basically wanted people to drive them. Um, <laughs> We drove it the whole way down to like a deep in Italy, in the middle of the heart of Italy, <clears throat> about two hours north of uh, Rome, and something blew up in the engine. Um, I've never really dealt with a Porsche before. I called the guy the day before, and I says, look, man, something's not right with this engine. I have never, like, I, I have a Volkswagen Beetle, and the Porsche and the Beetle are very similar, even though they're completely different price range, but the engine's completely different. And I says, look, I don't know enough about this engine to even go near it, and I don't want to touch it in case you sue my ass and the guy <laughs> laughed and he was like look no problem he says just drive it and it, when it breaks down let me know if it breaks down let me know so sure enough it broke down the next day and i called him up and the guy was super cool he was like man don't worry about it these things happen to cars 
And I was like, I wouldn't be this cool if some Irish asshole blew up the engine of my Porsche, but whatever. <laughs> and he uh, he then said, he says, book in the hotel. We will get you started in this hotel. We'll pay for your hotel, and I'll have a car down with you tomorrow. So Kelsey and I were in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean the middle of nowhere in Italy. I can't even remember the name of the place. And we found this hotel, and we told the lady at the at the desk our, in our pidgin English what our scenario was. And um, she gave us the honeymoon suite of the hotel. But this hotel obviously wasn't the kind of hotel that we thought it was. The honeymoon suite was obviously for executives to take hookers to. I'd never seen nothing like it in all my life. Oh my gosh! There, there was uh, the there was a mirror above the wall, a mirror above the bed, a mirror <laughs> on the roof, mirrors all the way around the room, oh jacuzzi in the corner. the The door handle was a pool ball. It was a number eight pool ball. Um, I'd never uh, seen nothing like it in my life. But Kelsey and I, I mean, we had a laugh. We had two bottles of red wine. And we had a good, time. we had a good time. I wouldn't but, expect um, it to be in Italy. You would expect that to be in like Vegas or something or Tulsa. It was I don't the know. strangest thing. I mean, in the middle of nowhere, and it looked like nobody had been in this room for a long time either. I don't know what they were. The, the hotel was like something that you'd see in Ozark that they bought, you know, when they tr- decided to do up, and it was hasn't been I touched in the sixties. I bet someone got murdered in there. Some executive strangled, strangled the. For sure. One hundred percent. A bunch of people were murdered in that room. I mean, of course. But the next day, the guy rocked up with a with a Ferrari, um, to make it up to us. He, he arrived with like a. Do you remember the Ferrari that was in a ah, uh, Magnum uh, Magnum PI? No. Know no. That Ferrari. It was like an eighties drug dealer Ferrari, a red convertible Ferrari, and he's like, "Hey, I want to make it up to you. Enjoy it." I couldn't believe it. <laughs> the Ferrari cost like what we what it cost us for the month for the for the ten days for the Porsche. The Ferrari cost that a day, and the guy gave it to us for like five or six days. Oh, that's so cool. Well, yeah, yeah it was pretty we're cool. supposed to have the Porsche, so it's his. You know, wow, that's service. I've, yeah, like, it pretty was. Because I've sometimes in Europe, customer service isn't what it should be or what we're used to in America. You know, yeah. like if you don't like your meal, you can't just go. I don't like this. Take it back. And then you don't yeah. have to pay for it. They go, oh, too bad, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that's just the way it is here. <laughs> a lot of Americans just, yeah, can't get their minds around that there's not the same type of customer service. So I'm impressed that he wasn't just like, oh, the Porsche broke down. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, the guy couldn't have been cooler. And I, I've never driven a car. You know, when you pull up to like, if you're in like Monaco or one of those super fancy kind of places. And you walk up to the hotel, and outside the hotel, the Bentleys are parked, and the Ferraris are parked, and they just keep all the fancy cars on the outside. Mm-hmm. I've never experienced that before, where you pull up to a hotel, and obviously, I do not look like someone that should own a really valuable, like that Ferrari is worth about 300 grand. And I was driving this Ferrari with long hair and like hippie sunglasses on me with a roof down. And they were like, just leave the car right here, sir. You know, you can park the car literally at the front door of every hotel you were at. I mean, it's probably worth your while just buying a Ferrari. You'll save that on parking fees for yeah. the rest. I mean, it'll pay for itself after a while, I'd reckon. That's funny. Yeah, I know. I'm always pulling up to hotels in like a rental car, like a Hyundai or or like <laughs> if I'm home, it's like I pull up in a in my Jetta and I'm like, yeah, just pull it around to the back, guys. <laughs> Dude, I bought I bought a, a, a 20-year-old Land Rover Defender. Uh, two months ago for our business here in in Ireland, I flew over to Scotland to get it, drove all day, got food poisoning that day, which is a different story altogether, got it to the ferry, go, drove it over on the ferry, and the head gasket blew on the way home, which was awesome, and then <laughs> I nursed it all the way home, um, I then drove it for two days after I got the head gas to fix, gasket fixed, and now it's been sitting in my driveway for a month. That's the beauty of cars. You just, we have a saying here in Ireland, you have to just take your oil. Where it's just like tough luck, shit happens. You have to deal with it. Car cars are the worst. They're the best. I love cars, but I also hate them yeah. like a lot. I've got three cars in my driveway right now, and they're all broke. Oh, I've no. got a van which is broke. I've got a Land Cruiser which is broke, and I've got a Defender which is broke. And I'll be broke if I keep trying to fix them. That's the problem <laughs> with cars, right there. Yeah. Um, Peace now. <laughs> Hey, were you were you in Nashville whenever the the big uh, tornado tore through like a month or two ago? Or yeah, you uh, were there? I sure was. I was at my house. Luckily, it didn't come by my house. Um, but we did have to. I got my roommates up, and we had to go down 
to the bottom floor and hide in the little half bath there. But it it hit it touched down like less than half a mile from my house. No so way, you were close. Really close. And then the next day, like I didn't know that it had touched down because I don't have cable, and it was like 1 a.m. And you know, when I found out it was the coast was clear, I we we just went back to bed. And then I woke up to like a million phone calls, people asking me if I was okay, and my phone was on silent. So people were freaking out. And finally I was like, it's fine. It's fine. My friend actually who lives this outside of town, like freaked out cause he couldn't get a hold of me. And he was, he actually drove down here from, from outside of town just to drive by my house to make sure it was still there. Like that's scary. I've never experienced that kind of fear, I guess, from just the elements, you know, from disaster. Cause it's just different. You know, I guess I've lived through some earthquakes in Los Angeles but I grew up in Phoenix so there was not really any there's no tornadoes there's no earthquakes the the scariest thing we have is like hail or a dust storm but yeah tornadoes are just really scary whereabouts in Phoenix are you from um uh, we had a house on the Biltmore golf course you know that my wife's my wife's from Phoenix she's from Awa I don't know Phoenix all that well but she's from a place called Awa Turkey do you know that yeah yeah that's um Gosh, I'm getting my bearings wrong, but yeah, that's that's Phoenix area, Awatuki. It's close to the mountain, kind of close to Tempe, where ASU is. Kinda, yeah. And so you lived there until you were 18. So you were yep. a Phoenix girl. Born and raised, desert rat. <laughs> desert rat. It's a lot different in Phoenix to to it, it, as it is here in Ireland. Um, I mean, you've been to Ireland. You were here. I missed you last time you were here, but you've you've toured Ireland. You've played here. You done a show with. Our Daniel. Daniel's actually from Donegal, for where oh, yeah. I am right now. This is where he's from. But yeah, you've toured Ireland, right? Yeah, yeah. Last last June, uh, I was there with my fiddle player for about ten days, and we did the. Um, we were in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, and um, gosh, what am I, we did the Daniel O'Donnell show, the Opry Le Daniel. <laughs> that was really fun. But I just had so much fun. Like I actually learned how to drive stick shift so that I could tour in Ireland and the UK um, <laughs> because it's so much cheaper to rent a stick shift car. Yeah. And so we got, you know, like a reno or something and <laughs> drove around. And I actually really I loved driving through Ireland. Like one one of the days we were driving from um, from Oma all the way down to the Cork area or no, we were driving from Oma to I can't remember Dublin to Cork. And I missed our exit on the motorway. And so it ended up adding like 40 minutes to our journey, but it took us through these beautiful fields and it was a sunny day. And so my fiddle player and I were just enjoying the detour. It was so cool. Like, you know, and oh God, I just love Ireland. I can't wait to go back. I hope I can go back. Hope the world doesn't end. Oh no, Jesus. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, next, next we time you come here, what's oh. that? Oh, I was going to say, and one one more thing about the, the road trips. We became obsessed with the, the Tato brand. Man, uh, uh, I the, normally the, eat. like I, My, my wife tato. is disgusted at me right now. I haven't stopped eating Tato's since I came home. I've been buying 20 bags, like 20 They're packs so good. of oh, Tato's. Can you send me some? Because we can't get I will happily tato. send you some. They're Whenever just... I used to tour with Celtic Thunder, when I used to tour with Celtic Thunder, our old show, <laughs> we used to get shipped. I kid you not. There's a company in New York called the Butcher's Block. You should check that out. I'm not sure if they're still doing that, but they used to do it. And they do everything from Ireland. They get a container like every second day sent from Ireland. So they do Irish bread, Irish chips, Irish fries, Irish sausages, yeah. Irish bacon. <laughs> and we used to get box loads of that shit sent to our tour bus. And I did like eat. I've been eating way too many of them since I've come home this time. I like have been destroying them. Oh. Um. <laughs> what's what's Daniel like? I have never. I've only I met Daniel O'Donnell briefly, the last night that I seen him. Um, I seen him in, in Derry that night after you guys filmed the show. I was I was having a drink with Chloe Agnew. Mm-hmm. Who, I'm not sure. Did you meet Chloe as well? I don't think I've met Chloe. Chloe was singing on the show as well. She was she's one of the uh, girl with blonde hair. Her. Long yeah. blonde. Yeah. yeah. Gospel yeah. singer. Um, I mean, she could sing the phone book. Chloe used to be in, she was in Celtic Woman as well. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I'm bad with names. I'm good with faces. Um, but what's it like working with Daniel? Daniel's like a legend back here. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've heard. Um, to me, he was just so sweet. So it's a genuinely nice person, you know, um, just really down to earth, 
sweet guy. Like I needed, um, I had a dress that I was going to wear for the show and I needed, I didn't have a steamer and it was all wrinkled. And he like invited me into his dressing room so I could use his steamer to <laughs> get the wrinkles out. And he was just super sweet and, you know, no big head, whatever, just down to earth, nice guy. Uh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so you are you, you mentioned stage it's. Are you doing many more of these online shows? Yeah, I'm actually doing one today after after I get off the Skype call with you. I've got one at 3 p.m. Nashville time. Oh, right. Amazing. Yeah. And it's did you really, do them before this, just out of interest? Did you did you do them before the I, apocalypse? Or is it I had never even heard of Stage It before the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd never heard of it, but I was I was just like, wow, how can I still do concerts? You know, um, that's like kind of an exclusive thing, and people can comment and and make requests, and maybe I can pay a couple of my bills. I don't know, but my friend suggested it, so we started trying it and it's kind of turning into a fun thing. And, and in addition to that, I'm, I'm still, you know, posting th- videos on Instagram and whatnot, but um, I also want to look into doing like, cause you know, I've, because of my dad, I've worked with, you know, retirement communities and memory care facilities. And I want to look into, um, I've actually been talking to someone about doing some live streams for people who are quarantined inside a retirement community and can't go out. But then I was thinking, like, are they allowed to hang out all together, or are they all quarantined in their they're separate not. rooms, or I don't know. They're all so, in their separate rooms. I th- I think my grandmother has been allowed out of her room. Yeah, so I'm like, I wonder how I could do that, because I was thinking, oh, yeah, because they all can sit in the common area, but I don't know. It's a weird time, but I'm, I'm actually going to call the place that my dad used to live at and, and see what they're doing, and if I can, you know, do any kind of online performance for them, and there's another one that my other friend, um, a friend of Jane's, do you know Sherry Ingle? Yeah. Yeah. So Sherry's been suggesting something like that as well. So I'm going to try and do that because, you know, everyone's so bored <laughs> staying at home. Well, hey, if, if, he, if they need anybody else, if you do get the, if you do want them, give me a shout. I'll happily oh, do a show for those awesome. people. Yeah, I will definitely reach out to you for that. And um, yeah, anyway, but I've been enjoying the live stream so much and, you know, I did my first one, I think I've done three of them so far. So I did my first one three weeks, uh, three weeks ago, this will be the fourth one. And, um, after the first one, I was wondering like, do people really like this? It's kind of, it's not like anything fancy. It's just me in my room. And then, um, I actually watched Ben Folds do one from his apartment. He's quarantining in Sydney right now and he's been doing them every Saturday. And, I, it was, it's just so delightful. I watched it again last night. He did one yesterday and, and I was like, yes, it's, it's just a way to connect with your fans, you know, and in a genuine real way in real time, like the live aspect of it. Cause usually when we watch videos of, of people, of artists that we love, it's, it's pre-recorded, it's edited, it's blah, blah, blah. But just the rawness and the realness of watching one of your favorite artists play you songs in real time from their apartment or home it's so special and it doesn't matter if it sounds good it doesn't matter if it looks good it's just so cool to be it's like you're facetiming with your heroes so yeah it's just it's so much fun so i love watching them as much as i love doing them it's so funny what you just said there now about people posting stuff and it being edited and everything else and i literally said to Kelsey today, Kelsey, uh, Waylon, our son right now is teething. So the last three days have been an absolute nightmare. It's just like, it's schizophrenic. Like one second You're he's ready. fine. Then he's like, oh man, he's got he's two top teeth just started cutting down in the last like two days. So we haven't had a lot of sleep, but I was just got it. It took like me, me like an hour and a half today to get him back to sleep for his, like for a 20 minute nap. It took an hour and a half. But anyway, um, and I lay in the bed and I was just sitting on my phone and I was, I'm, you actually don't do this. You're like myself. I when I post a song on Instagram or Facebook or on the YouTube, and it's like you just playing the acoustic guitar. It is actually you just playing the acoustic or the banjo and actually singing. And the amount of people I hope you are all listening right now who are posting things that yeah. they've spent they've spent forever. Oh hey hey guys hi hi. <laughs> Sorry, um, I had a phone spent, call. That's all good. But they've spent forever editing the voice and editing the guitar, and then they mime to the voice and the guitar. 
after the after they posted, you know, in the video. And what what makes me tired of that is a lot of people watching that today, kids watching that today, they all think that that's how people actually sound. They all think that that's how you should sound. And in reality, nobody actually sounds that perfect. You know, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you you probably sound that perfect. You know, but a lot of people don't sound that perfect. I actually said to my wife today on Instagram, I was like, I am unfollowing everybody who posts things where they recorded it and then they're miming it. They make it look live. It really, and I actually started unfollowing lots of people today on social oh, yeah. media because it just, I just, I don't, just don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. I think we all just want people to be real with us, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's more for kids too, because when kids see it, kids must be like, is that how everybody sounds? God, I, like it must be so down putting for kids because, you know, it's the imperfections that make things perfect within, well, I think that within music anyway, it's the imperfections that make things perfect. Um, so Ashley, when, so on your stage, it, I'll let you go because I'm sure you have to go and sound check and do these things. Um, you're just Ashley Campbell on stage it. Yep. Just Ashley Campbell on stage it. And my Instagram is Ash Cam Banjo. Same for my Facebook and Twitter. Check it out. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for the stage it show today. I'm just going to be playing some of my original songs, some of the songs that are unreleased from my new album and a couple of my favorite covers. I'm planning on doing a, a Harry Nilsson song. Um, I haven't decided which, which one, one yet. Um, either, um, without her, you know, I spend the night in the chair thinking she'll be there, but she never comes. Yeah. And, um, I also love, I might play, um, sit beside the breakfast table, think about your troubles, pour yourself. Harry Nielsen was uh, amazing. He was so incredible. I'm, I'm friends with his son and, um, I didn't know how incredible he was until I watched his son gave me the documentary called who is Harry Nilsson. I don't know if you've amazing. seen it. Yeah, so yeah, good. I was like, my mind was blown. I'm such a big fan. His music is so incredible. Ugh. Anyway, but so yeah, not not only not only like his pop songs, he also don't like you know put the lime in the coconut and switch it all around as a doctor. Yeah, if you haven't heard of Harry Harry Nilsson, then you but you you've definitely heard of his songs. And what's crazy also is that his biggest hits were songs that he didn't write, like his biggest hits that he sang, like Everybody's Talking and um, I Can't yeah. Live If Living Is Without You. He didn't write those, but yeah. he did write hits for other people. Like, um, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. Yeah, he's just amazing. Awesome. You should do a whole heart. I mean, I love Harry. Harry Nielsen. I, I mean, I cover Harry Nielsen when I do my sets. Nearly every night I do it and everybody's talking at me. I always mm. I always do one of, one of your dad's songs. I always throw one or two Glenn Campbell songs in there. Mm. Like, what happened? What happened to music? Why isn't music like that anymore? Why isn't? Why, why, what happened? Tell me. And did you know that my dad actually recorded without her too? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's on one of his albums. I can't remember which one, but you can look up Glenn Campbell without her, and that's that's the Harry Nilsson song that he recorded. He also recorded Everybody's Talking um, on his latest album, but and I played banjo on that one. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Um. Well, Ashley, it was an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for chatting some crap with me for a while. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed that. I will, um, I'll send you the links to all this stuff whenever it's all done. I will post all your Instagram handles and stuff like that. This show is going to be posted probably in a day or two. Um, so I'm sure you'll be doing other stages. So everybody, if you're listening, just check out Ashley on stage. If you go up to the search bar and type in her name, it'll come up and you can see her shows pop up right there. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll see you later. All right. Bye. Bye.